G'day and welcome to Snap Happy, the photography show. I'm Jason Edwards. And I'm Maddie Claire Sloan. Jace, you received your Snapfish photo book today. I did, Mads, and I'm really pleased with it. One of the things that I love about the book is that it comes with a translucent fly sheet on the front and rear pages, which makes it look really professional. Now I chose the premium photo book because it comes with metallic paper as standard. Now you can see that this paper really lifts my images. Some of them even look three dimensional. Now photographers are always looking for good colour separation, which means the differences between the colours when producing a book. And this is really, really nice. Also, the blacks are really rich and dense, which is what we also like. Now the paper has been treated with a laminate, which gives it a durability suitable for people using the book all the time, which is what you want. You don't want the pages to fall apart the first few times it's been handled. Now I had a lot of fun laying out this book and the software was really easy to use. But more importantly, the book arrived in about a week, so we didn't have to wait months and months to see the finished product. We should be really happy with it because it looks fantastic and what a great way to share your photos with family and friends and potential clients. So what are you up to, Mads? Well, I chat with Gary Heary about celebrity photography and a recent series that he photographed using the new Fujifilm GFX. The photo right here was taken from his ICE series. What about you, Jace? Where are you off to? Well, I'm heading to the Northern Territory and I'm going to look at the horse culture there. I'm also going to look at the impact of wild brumbies on the environment. All this and more on today's episode of Snap Happy, the photography show. I think that's looking damn fine, man. Happy about that. I'm a photographer who grew up in America as a celebrity photographer. In the early 70s, I started in my career in LA and did multiple record covers, including Madonna and um, Graceland, Roy Orbison, and, you know, Frank Zappa. It's a bit of a disease creativity, you know? like. You just can't stop. Okay, here we go. Freezing of time is a fascinating thing, isn't it? So I like the idea that the clock could explode and frozen in time. Quite beautiful, the macro. Well, there's always something great about the macro aspect of things like this when you can see the detail of it all. Shooting today with the new Fuji, GFX. It's a very versatile camera, I can tell already. The gun, we're ready for the gun. The gun in the ice. That was the original image I had, and we were worried about that because it's slightly complicated. I want you to feel like it's in the camera. I want you to feel it's real. You know what's really cool about it is it looks like it's broken. It. Oh gosh, look how good that screen is. That's the first time in my life to look at a screen, I can tell it's in focus. I can already see on the screen, the quality of the image is brilliant. I'm thinking that the prints could be quite massive so that you've got some sort of sense of um, the macro quality of the ice and the texture that it's in. And the more deconstructed it is, the better. We have the time at the egg time where the, that is broken and then time has escaped from it. Not only is it passing, but it's escaping, and you'll know this as you get older, and that it's going way too quick. That's beautiful. I've transferred the things I've learned as a portrait photographer to nearly everything else. Whatever I'm doing, I treat it with the same sense of portraiture, the same sense of engagement. There's multiple focus points, which is really good. I try and shoot in almost a classic sense of photography. I want you to feel connected to what I do. This feels uh, much more a, a, a natural partner. I could easily use it as, the, you know, my full-time camera. So Gary, you've had this amazing career full of highlights. Tell us what was it like being a celebrity photographer in Los Angeles? I meet Norman Seif, and Norman is a South African um, ex-doctor has become the record cover photographer in America, unbeknownst to me. And I said, well, I'm looking for some work. And he said, well, what can you do in the darkroom? I had no experience except I developed some films in Sydney and I'd mucked around in photography and done some prints and I, said, I, know I basically lied. And I said, I know everything. And he <laughs> said, well, that was my old assistant. He just left the room and we've got a shoot on tonight and would you join us like this? 
I thought, yeah, no, no, no problem. I can do all that. Anyway, what the shoot was, was Ike and Tina Turner. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I bluffed my way through it. And eventually I became Norman's assistant for a year or so. And then I moved on. So I just started my own studio. And I, and because of working with Norman in record covers, I got one record cover the next. And my career just slowly multiplied. And I was became a celebrity photographer. Amazing. Yeah. You just kind of fell into it. I've, yeah. <laughs> I've seen you working on a new project with the Fujifilm GFX. Tell us about that. I'm almost going back to my roots because I've got this big format camera and you know the great thing about this camera is it looks like an SLR. It looks like the first camera I had. All the dials are on the top but it's so easy to work. Yeah. It's all right in front of me. I don't even look at focus, I know what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. In fact, I'm thinking that I'm here I am out on my own with this now. And usually I've got a whole host of people with me on all the projects I do. I've got assistants and stuff going on, and, you know. When you've had a lot of experience with something, you know, I can, I can see the end product. Yeah. In fact, it's staggering what you can get people to do in front of a camera. You just, you just can't believe what what the power of it is sometimes. Last season I got my hands on the Fujifilm X-T2 and I've had it in my kit now for 12 months. And I have to tell you, I'm loving this camera. Now I'm about to take it into the desert in the Northern Territory and put it through its paces in a completely different environment. I'm photographing these wonderful sandstone beehive formations. Now I'm trying to show the different layering and the weathering within the rock. Now, like most landscape photography, you want to have a lot of depth of field, a lot of things in focus. So try and use an f-stop with a large number, f16, f22, f32. The more in focus, the better. I'm here at the Uluru Camel Cup and the kids are gearing up for a wheelbarrow race. So what I'm going to try and do is get a little bit of the action, high shutter speed, lots of frames per second, as they come down this sandy track pushing these barrows. If you're at an event and there's multiple heats, make sure you change your angle and your position, just to give a different perspective to tell the story. So the first time I shot the race going past me, then I've come back to the start. Now I'm in the middle of the desert and the sun's out, which is fantastic, but the contrast is extreme. So I'm not using a fill flash, not everyone has a flash on their camera. And what I'm trying to do is use those dark shadows of the kids in the wheelbarrow as part of my composition. Think outside the box. You never know what you're going to get. And the final, for $100 mind you, was the kids running down the track to get their wheelbarrows and then sprint back. I think that's probably the most interesting shot I've got as these kids have powered in, spun around in the dust and then taken off again with these barrows. I'm in the desert west of Alice Springs trying to photograph wild brumbies. And last night I took the Fujifilm X-T2 out under this magnificent starry sky to see how it performed. And it did wonderfully. How did I do it? Well, I set my ISO to 6400 which is quite high, but the camera handled it fine. I set my f-stop between 3.5 and 5.6. I varied it a little bit. And then my exposure, I ran between 20 seconds and 30 seconds at different increments. And the results were fantastic. I've thoroughly enjoyed using this camera in the desert this week. The conditions were tough, lots and lots of dust, but it was really reliable, very light and very quiet. It's reminded me of what cameras were like years ago when I first began my career. Perfect in the hand and everything exactly positioned where it needs to be. Happy shooting. Hi, I'm Gary Heary and uh, essentially I'm an art photographer at the stage of my career and I do commercial work, and I've done seven books. Um, I have a really broad, interesting, and versatile career. And this is what's in my Fuji kit. This is the first lens I will use, the one that, that I was using on the ICE series, and it's a 63 millimeter. The secret with digital cameras is that they're the sharpest in the mid f-stop. 
So even though it's got 32 on here, the sharpest part of this camera would be f11 and significantly sharper. And the other thing about the camera is that's really nice, it's got, of course, it's got this lovely little tilt up. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit old school, I tend to shoot, like from a Hasselblad, I tend to learn how to shoot shooting down on the camera. I can quickly adjust the shutter speed and the ISO right here, and I can see where I'm at. And then I'm looking down directly onto the screen. Everything's, all the info's coming up really quickly. If you wanted to, you could just shoot JPEGs. They're that big and that great. And then this is the other lens I use on the day, it's the macro lens. And you've got to remember I used these for the first time in this project, but in fact, they were, they were, this one was even more perfect, I'd say, because it's a macro and it's, it's st staggeringly sharp. But I, I think it's a great portrait lens as well. You step back and it's a great portrait lens. It's got a good, really good feel, okay? If you're working commercially, you need a lens that's going to be versatile for you on the camera and you don't want to be changing lenses all the time. So I've got this 32 to 64, which I, I forget how you translate that back to a smaller camera. It's different because it's a, bit, it's a big format camera. I'm Gary Heary and that's what's in my Fuji kit. In the Australian outback, there is a strong horse culture. Come on, horse In Hermansburg, west of Alice Springs, it's no different. And the local school has taken advantage of this to engage with local students. Chris and Kerry Barr train these students in horse management as part of their studies. I have driven out to the remote Ipalira outstation, where I've met up with Kerry who is going to take us to a local watering hole. So Kerry, you know, magnificent landscape. Where are we? We're at Gilbert Springs, West McDonald Ranges, um, a couple of hours west of Alice Springs. It's pretty spectacular, isn't it? It is, it's really nice. The afternoon light's falling down, so getting better by the second. We've got natural cycads and palms here that have been here for thousands of years, so this is a natural oasis in the desert. Yeah. All animals drinking just from this one waterway so it supports all life. I've returned to Central Australia to continue my work on wild horses known as Brumby, and I can hear the horses in the scrub waiting to come down to this dwindling pool to drink. I'm hoping to capture some behaviour before the sun sets below the horizon. Just as we were setting up to do another piece to camera, we were alerted to Brumbies on the other side of the watering hole. But just like that, we broke the first rule of wildlife photography. Number one rule, don't move, pick a spot, stay. Shouldn't have moved, they would have come right to me. A few moments later, the Brumbies appeared along the ridge. I waited patiently, not making a sound, but the horses were timid, circling around us a few times, but refusing to come down to the water. So, uh, didn't manage to get anything today? Quite often the case with wildlife photography, you can go weeks or months sometimes without getting what you want. You know, the light's gone out of the sky, so I'm gonna call it quits. I'll come back before dawn and set up again. Fingers crossed, might get something in the morning. This wasn't the first time I'd been to this exact watering hole. A couple of years ago, I was on assignment here with Australian Geographic to document the wild horse population and the issues their great numbers present to the Australian environment. Australia is riddled with feral species, including wild horses, known as brumbies. Now, it's a really contentious issue on how we manage this species. This is a soak in the desert. I've worked here before, photographing the horses as they come in to drink. Now, most people think that they're probably out here living a life of luxury, but I can tell you from personal experience, it's not the case. The desert is a hard and harsh place to live. You need to remember that these species were not meant to inhabit Australia. Their hard hooves are not suited to this fragile desert country, and they really do have a negative impact on the environment. So dawn hasn't risen yet, and we're out in the desert trying to get these horses again. It's pretty damn chilly but we're going to go down into a riverbed and set up in the dark and hopefully some of the mobs will come in to drink at these dwindling pools of water. So in an ideal situation, it's best to get into a photographic position early. So this morning we've come down before dawn and set up at a different spot in the hope that they'll come in and drink from this dwindling pool. 
Fingers crossed. A very common misconception is that wildlife shoots last for weeks or months. That's rarely the case. There's just not the time or the budgets. The last time I was at this soak, there was mobs of horses coming in. This morning, we can hear them around us. They're just not coming down to the water. But we did just have a dingo come in, cautiously going across the plates of rock. So that was a win. I haven't seen dingo here before. You just don't know what's going to happen. Wildlife photography is an arduous and fickle pastime. No amount of research or preparation guarantees success. After all these years, the one thing I know is that I'll have wins and I'll have losses, but I try and go into it and enjoy the experience. Happy shooting. So Gary, what are some portrait tips you can give us today? Number one tip is like, sometimes people choose to be a, a portrait photographer when they don't have the personality for mm -hmm. it, okay? You've got to either develop it or pick some other aspect of photography. Landscape. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's going to work for you. And I think you should set yourself projects, like, right? So you should say, I'm going to do trees or something. And then I think you should go and look at all the things that other people did of trees, yep. okay? And then you should try and get past the square. What my game is, is to make you look at things like you've never seen them before. Mm -hmm. It's a simple, my simple rule about photography. So just come at it from an angle that goes, I've never seen that before or oh, I've never quite looked at it yeah. that way. Look at that. I'm standing on a cliff over the treasury in Petra, Jordan. It's a masterpiece of Nabataean architecture. It dates from the 1st century BC to the 1st century AD, and it's believed to be the tomb of a Nabataean king. There's so much to see at that site. The gorge runs off in all directions. It's known as the Seek, and there's sheer walls, and it's absolutely magnificent. But my suggestion is for you to get here early, because once that desert light gets up, the contrast really increases. You can probably see that now. There's also lots and lots of tombs scattered throughout these desert mountains, so don't be afraid to go for a walk. Wide lenses everywhere. But I've also got a 200mm to take details of some of this magnificent architecture. It's stone cut and has stood the test of time. It's magnificent in every way. I'll see you at the next site. Throughout the series, we've seen some of Australia's top photographers using the Wacom tablets. I'm here at Jason's office and we're going to chat with Katie, his executive assistant. So Katie, you've been working with Jace for a while now. What's your role in the office? I'm Jason's executive assistant and also his digital asset manager, which means I process and balance his images for him. Fabulous. You've just got your hands on the Wacom Intuos Pro. First impressions? Oh, this thing's really cool. Instead of a mouse, I can use a pen mm -hmm. and it has a tablet which represents my whole screen. So I can use the pen to just go in move around and use it like a mouse, except I get all this extra functionality. So I can be really precise with my brush strokes, but then I can just also use the, my fingers to scroll around on a screen like you would handy. on a laptop. Yeah, Super handy. So what's it like using the pen rather than the mouse? Is it easy to get used to? It's a little difficult at first because you're quite surprised at how it feels like a real pen mm -hmm. rather than something plasticky. It's got a really nice texture to it. And then the other thing is, is that it's sensitive like a pen would be. So rather than with a mouse where it's just on or off, there's no sort of in-between, you can use it like you would a brush or anything in an art kind of space. Mm -hmm. So you can lightly draw or you can press down firmly or you can add extra layers and keep going and going. It's really awesome to use actually. So has it improved your productivity and creativity at all? The place where I've really found the Wacom tablet to be useful and kind of a new thing for me is that when I'm doing my fine and creative style uh, processing, I can really speed up that whole process. I can really get in there really quickly, fix up those highlights, touch up those shadows, bring in some extra details that would have been a lot of hard work to do in the past, but now, yeah, it's so easy. Last, last question here. What is it like to work with Jace? <laughs> it's mostly a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> actually, we have a lot of fun together. Also, you know, <laughs> managing his ego is always entertaining. <laughs> he's really, he's, yeah, he's a bit of a bride. So I'll have to have a chat with Katie about that when I see her. Well, I loved Katie and her honesty. 
<laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Jace, what's next for you? Well, I've got some shoots in Pacific, doing some more underwater work, which is great. And I'll be back in Africa and, and probably back in the Amazon. So I've got a bit on the plate. Looking forward to following your journey. Thank you. Now, if you'd like to join our Snap Happy community, head on over to our website at snaphappytv.com for exclusive content, competitions and offers from our partners. See you next time on Snap Happy, the photography show.